Okay, well, I'm honoured to be here amongst so uh, many uh, wonderful and prominent people and uh, so many uh, persons who are interested in Christianity and culture. And I've had a great time since I arrived. I enjoyed being in my hotel room yesterday and watching Tonga beat New Zealand in the Rugby League World Cup. But unless you've been living in a cave, you would have noticed that there was a big announcement on Wednesday morning. The Yes campaign won the postal survey. And many of you could be opining that Olympus has fallen, Christendom is over. Maybe a bit worried, but I'll be honest, I'm not terribly, uh, I'm not terribly shocked. I'm not terribly surprised by the result, but it's clear that we are definitely living in a post-Christian era. The game has certainly changed. We are not the moral majority we thought we were. For many, we are in fact the immoral minority. So what are you going to do? And I have no idea what you're going to do. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to try analyze how I think we got to this point. I'm going to reflect on what I think is likely to come. Then I want to begin strategizing over something that we might do. Okay, that's... okay. how did we get to this point? I mean, 20 years ago, same-sex marriage seemed very unlikely. And yet, simply by uttering the words, it's 2017, now makes it obvious to a lot of people that it's time to legislate for same-sex marriage. Well, there's a number of things that change in our culture. Let me explain what they are. First of all, our culture has a strong belief in moral autonomy. We live at a time where individual freedom to live as one wishes is the center of social ethics. The presupposition is that humans are free agents, capable of and entitled to self-determination, even if their uh, individual choices go against collective mores. Now, moral autonomy can be curtailed if a person's actions is directly injurious to another person. But apart from that, we tend to be pretty permissive. Thomas Jefferson was happy to condone any behavior as long as he said it neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. In sociological terms, our culture is individualist and permissive, not collectivist and conformist. A second aspect of our culture is that we're dealing with therapeutic scales of ethics. Now, cultures differentiate right from wrong in different ways. And traditionally in the West, we think in terms of guilt and innocence. In other places, they think of honor and shame, purity and impurity, power and weakness, common cause and common detriment. But these days, we tend to put right and wrong on the spectrum between the polarities of pain and pleasure. What causes pain is bad. What causes pleasure is good. If not being able to marry someone you love causes you anguish or pain, then it's bad. Uh, if you are in any sense of physical pain, uh, mental depression, uh, we must end that even if by means of euthanasia. Uh, this, this therapeutic context, which sociologists have noted, explains a lot of how we rank and understand right and wrong. Third, you need to understand the political language of the left. According to Arnold King, there are three basic political languages, conservative, libertarian, and progressive. Conservatives tend to operate in the categories of civilization and barbarism. I mean, that's classic Tony Abbott's way of, of configuring things. Libertarians tend to think in terms of freedom versus coercion, and progressives speak the language of a presser and the oppressed. In the progressive language game, a heterosexual white male is inherently worse than Hitler because he embodies the heteronormativity, the patriarchy, and the white privilege that is symbolically and sociologically a cause of oppression to various minorities. In the progressive pyramid, your authority derives not from so much from achievement or ability, but from your minority status and experiences of victimization. So that means in an argument, a white woman trumps a white man. A black woman trumps a white woman. 
A disabled woman trumps a black woman, and a disabled black transgendered Muslim refugee trumps pretty much everybody. <laughs> In the progressive language game, uh, the disadvantages and discriminations of the LGBTI community, which I believe are real, gives them moral capital to be spent on things like legislating for same-sex marriage. And then they, you add to that moral autonomy, it's what they want, uh, it, it'll make them happy, so that's it's, so on those therapeutic scales, then you can see it. But every single issue, whether it's euthanasia, same-sex marriage, everything can be determined of either being the oppressor or the oppressed. Okay, the fourth issue. Religion in our culture is associated with terrorism and child sex abuse. Since about 9-11, so you know, around 2000, whenever we hear about religion on TV, it's usually associated either with terrorism or child sex abuse. Now, no matter how many times you say not all Muslims are terrorists, not all clergy or pedophiles, the sad is that is what people think about when they hear the word religion. In which case it's hard for religious leaders to speak on almost any moral issue. It is actually difficult to talk about same-sex marriage and its uh, negative implications for children when you've read some of the reports on the Royal Commission into Child Abuse. And as an Anglican priest who's had to look at and read some of the horrible Accounts. It's a, it's a horror story, but it's real. I do kind of have to concede the point. Fifth, we have to understand that the sexual revolution is the new state religion. The English journalist Malcolm Muggeridge put it eloquently when he said, if God is dead, somebody is going to have to take his place. It will be megalomania or erotomania, the drive for power or the drive for pleasure. The clenched fist or the phallus, Hitler or you Hefner. I want to suggest for political progressives, sex, sexual identity, the sexualization of culture and its revolutionary politics has filled this God void and achieved quasi-divine status. The tradents of the sexual revolution have deified their ideals and turned society into a massive altar for the worship of sexual gratification. Now let me say not everything in the sexual revolution is bad. I tend to think equal pay for women and not being har harassed in the workplace are actually pretty good. I think you'll, you'll agree with that. Not everything is bad there. However, the sexual revolution has made sex an idol and reduced personal identity to the sum of its sexual desires. The sexual revolution has become a belief system with a religious texture. The sexual revolution has its own canon of sacred literature. Alfred Kinsey's Sexual Behavior of the Human Male. Germaine Greer's The Female Eunuch. It has its own bishops and progressive politicians, its own clergy and journalists and activists. It has its own patron saints, Margaret Sanger, its own martyrs, Hillary Clinton, its own theologian and pope in Peter Singer, its own religious festivals and sexpo, a network of evangelists and university campuses. It has its own sacraments of pornography and abortion, it has its own liturgies of hookup rituals, its own version of the eschaton, which is androgyny, completely erasing the distinctions between men and women. The sexual revolution has moved out from the hippie communes at Nimbin and the university campus, and it's now a state-sanctioned religion which demands obeyance and obedience. Consequently, our culture is divided between two competing religions. The God of Christian theism, theism who calls us to worship him and to enjoy him forever, and we have the eroticized deity of progressives who want us to worship what it is that turns us on. And in the state religion, it means every time you hear the Macklemore song, Same Love, we're supposed to bow down before a hundred foot golden phallus draped in a rainbow th flag and utter the creed, there is no God but sex and orgasm is his prophet. <laughs> if that is the state religion, then Christians are atheists. We are heretics in the state religion. Now, I could say more about the sexual re revolution, pro and con, uh, but uh, uh, Gabrielle Kuba will have more to say that in her wonderful book, which I can say is, es ist ein sehr gut Buch. 
it is a good book. So let's, let's take what we've got. We've got a culture with moral autonomy, therapeutic scales of ethics, the political language of oppressor and oppressed, religion is bad, sexual revolution is a quasi-religion. In that context, I submit to you, Christian views of marriage are not simply incomprehensible, they are reprehensible. You people don't understand how sick, twisted and weird you look to the world around you. So that's the analysis. Now let me reflect on what is to come. The legalization of same-sex marriage is not the end of the issue. People of faith, Jews, Christians, and Muslims will have, I believe, their religious exemptions revoked. We will face punitive actions if we voice our views of family, marriage, and sexuality. You only have to say the words Julian Porteous, who did with malice and heinousness of forethought, did try teach Catholic beliefs to Catholics. That's what he was facing. And if you look at other places around the world, Catholic adoption agencies in the UK, Trinity Western University in Canada, you'll know what I'm talking about. Further proof of that is a couple of articles written by journalist Sarah Malik for the ABC and The Guardian, arguing, in effect, that the existence of Jews, Christians, and Muslims with traditional views of marriage is an existential threat to the LGBTI community. It causes anguish for LGBTI people to know that there are people out there who do not affirm their relationship status. It's traumatic for them to hear someone articulate the case for traditional marriage. In order to protect the LGBTI community, from the pain of non-affirmation, it will be necessary to silence traditionalists. In progressive land, or as I call it, Melbourne grad, uh, that makes perfect sense. Within that, that context, it makes sense. I am pretty sure the progressive trinity, guardian, get up, the Greens, will argue that Christians, by refusing to change their views on family, marriage, and sexuality, by denying a plastic and constructed view of human identity, uh, they are guilty of misanthropy, hatred of the human race, which is what Jews and Christians were accused of by the Romans. Political progressives regard hatred as the only possible motivation for holding to a traditional view of marriage, and then that justifies their own sense of hate. Given these deep divisions then uh, on same-sex marriage or between North Sydney and Western Sydney, <laughs> there's two ways that we can deal with them. Option number one, confident pluralism. Uh, John Inazu is a political philosopher who's written a great book on, political, uh, on polit uh, political pluralism. I recommend it. Now, we could attempt to manage differences within diversity. So there are rights and protections for LGBTI people, and I mean that sincerely. Uh, over the course of my life, I have witnessed firsthand homophobic violence. I, I sincerely believe that we need to provide rights and protections maximal uh, in our society. But I also believe in religious freedom where people can worship, believe, and serve the community out of their religious convictions. Confident pluralism is really quite simple. People have the right to be different, to think different, to live different, without fear of reprisal, whether they are gay, God-fearing, or both. Confident pluralism allows genuine differences to coexist without suppressing or minimizing our firmly held convictions. Or as MP Tim Wilson said, a free society does not seek to homogenize belief or conscience, but instead affirms diversity and advocates for tolerance and mutual respect. Amen to that. Sadly, that is not what we should expect. What we will get is something called civic totalism. Sociologist Stephen Maketo has described a political philosophy of civic totalism where the state is invested with all power and seeks to regulate as much as public and private life as possible. In civic totalism, the state prosecutes a convergence of public and private values, requiring government to be empowered with the ability to turn people's deepest convictions, including religious belief, in directions that are congruent with the ways of a progressive state. 
Consequently, religion too within civic totalism is regarded as dangerous since religion describes notions of ultimacy to something other than the state and the state's vision of the public good. Religion creates a competing social vision and an alternative morality which divides the loyalty of citizens away from the state's objectives for human conduct, rendering certain forms of religion as hostile to the state's ambitions. The German philosopher and social theorist Jürgen Habermas contends that the consciousness of the faithful must be modernized and forced to acquiesce and accept the individualistic and egalitarian norms of the secular state. It is the civic totalizing conviction as it applies to religion that is leading contemporary political philosophers and sociologists to dare to imagine the prospect of the state forcibly bringing religion into alignment with progressive ideologies. According to two Australian authors, Carolyn Evans and Beth Gaze, they are right, there is an increasingly powerful movement to subject religions to the full scope of discrimination laws, with some scholars now suggesting that even core religious practices, such as the ordination of clergy, can be regulated in the name of equality. Do not write this off as an academic thought bubble. It was this very same sort of thinking that led Hillary Clinton to say in the context of a speech about women's rights, this is what she said, laws have to be backed up with resources and political will, deep-seated cultural values, religious beliefs, and structural biases have to be changed. This is while she was campaigning for the presidency. Ominous words indeed. As much as I believe in confident pluralism, I am expecting civic totalism. So we can expect punitive actions against Christian schools and charities. Discrimination against those holding to a traditional view of marriage and family. We will experience Erastian policies, attempts to intervene in the practices of religious organizations. We saw that in uh, Victoria and it was narrowly defeated trying to require the um, religious schools, charities, and houses of worship to justify to the state why they, the people they employ who are not clergy have to have a faith commitment. Expect more banners saying crucify Christians. So I'm sorry to be a deliverer of bad news, but that's coming your way. So what do we do about this? Well, there's a number of options. You could go the Stockholm Syndrome route. Now, if you don't know what Stockholm Syndrome is, look it over on Google. Basically, if you can't beat them, join them. So redefine your faith to get with the progressive program. They bring it, you bless it. Uh, no, I'm not doing that. Another option is called the Benedict Option. We heard a little bit last night at the dinner where conservative journalist Rod Dress says, look, you know, stop investing your hopes in political processes. Uh, we need to withdraw to our own monasteries, metaphorical or real, and create our own distinct um, cu culture on the margins. Uh, I see the attraction of that, but the problem is, in our context, wherever you go, the more militant secularists are coming for you. Your very existence for some, for the fringe elements, is a hate crime. Civic totalism does not want a neutral public square. Civic totalism is not content for these monasteries to exist. They must be regulated by the state. Uh, don't put your hope for a great Christian prince. Uh, we've had Christian politicians, Tony Abbott, Mike Baird, and it did not exactly usher in the millennium. So that's not going to be, I think, our main hope. I've come up with my own suggestion, which I have called the Thessalonian strategy, uh, which I'm, I'm hoping to uh, explain more on a book coming out next year. So um, I, I don't care if you read it, just make sure you buy it. <laughs> Paperweight, doorstop, I don't care. You know, when Paul arrived in Thessalonica, he and his co-workers had a well-earned reputation of turning the world upside down. 
That's because they were, a cha- they were challenging the idolatries, the injustices, the pretentiousness of imperial ideology. Paul dared to say Jesus is Lord and Caesar is not. Paul saw himself as a royal ambassador. I mean, he wasn't asking people to try Jesus the way you might try a new decaf mochaccino from Starbucks. He was declaring that Jesus is Lord, announcing that Israel's God had acted in Jesus' death and resurrection and through him was bringing forgiveness and peace and reconciliation to the world. This was a royal summons to follow Jesus the Lord. The Thessalonian strategy means we have to do the same, not retreat to our monasteries, metaphorical or real. We have to turn the world upside down. Now, I don't mean we need to somehow uh, engage in a battle for the old Christendom. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not interested in Christendom, the Constantinization of society. We need to campaign for the freedom to practice and promote our views, not just our own, but freedom for everyone, Muslims, Mor- Mormons, Sikhs, Buddhists, and the like. The Thessalonian strategy is about fighting for a confident pluralism where we love our neighbors by allowing them to be other. We turn the world upside down by constituting ourselves as an alternative community of freedom and love. We turn the world upside down by exposing the menacing ethos of a militant progressivism that limits freedom and deliberately cultivates division. I believe such a strategy is necessary given an environment where political progressives believe it is necessary to curtail and combine religious freedom to achieve its social vision. These are people who believe that religion is the one thing holding us back from creating a truly inclusive society. So to avoid being driven out of education and charity work, to prevent our voices from being muted, our sermons from being subpoenaed, we have to wage a campaign of sorts, but not armed with weapons or Molotov cocktails or anything like that. We need to, we need to do it with the weapons of peace and pluralism. We have to engage the strategy, we have to engage the political progressives, disclose their hypocrisy, reveal their propensity for violence, which many, I think, left wing senators have actually endorsed. We need to shine a light on their predatory nature of their behavior. The center of gravity in the progressive scheme is that they occupy the moral high ground and they are the forces of light against darkness. We need to shine a light of that and say there's a lot of darkness in that rainbow. (laughs) That can be no empty claim though. We must demonstrate this by listening rather than silencing our opponents, explaining rather than demonizing, affirming people's right to be different rather than demanding uniformity. As I was going to say, our strategy needs to expose how Political progressivism, at least at its worst, engages in threatening, intimidating, humiliating, silencing, and penalizing those who do not share progressive values. We have to point out that the new tolerance looks like some manifestations of the old tyrannies. In fighting a perceived monster, many of the progressives are actually becoming something far worse. I mean, I, I, mean, I would quote to them words of Jesus, but they won't believe me, so I quote to them Friedrich Nietzsche. When you fight a monster, make sure it's not you who becomes the monster. Because when you stare into the abyss, the abyss stares back into you. They may think of themselves as Martin Luther King in a new form, but to me they look like a hipster version of Robespierre. (laughs) But that means there's going to be a number of things we're going to have to do. I've got a list up there. I won't go into everything. But we're going to have to engage in a lot more interfaith cooperation. The good, thing, the good thing we have, we had, I think Muslims are our allies in this. I mean, look, if it was up to the Greens, they would close every Christian and Catholic school and turn it into a factory to make cannabis-flavored tofu. <laughs> but they won't do that to a Muslim school because they're still trying to do the anti-Islamophobia thing. Okay? So Muslims are our co-belligerents on this, and Mormons and Sikhs and whoever. We need to need to the best. We need to look to leadership, I believe, from immigrant and minority communities. Okay? Um, you know, being a Queenslander, I get a hard time when I come to New South Wales. You know? <laughs> Queenslanders suck. That's why we beat them in rugby league 9% of the time. <laughs> But if you want to know what the experiments of constant, okay, denigration, prejudice, discrimination, 
Speak to someone from the Assyrian church, the Coptic church. Someone who's been a, 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 an Anglican refugee from Sudan. Okay? Those are the people we need because they know what it's like to be a minority who's hated and despised. Look to leadership from the minority church. I don't know who is going to replace Lyle or who, would, who he would be worthy to fill such shoes. But I, maybe the person who replaces him might have a bit of brown skin. Who knows? We'll see in the future. So that's what I think we've got. That's what we have to do. We need some forms of creative resistance. Let me come to a close. I've tried to analyze what's happened. Tried to reflect on what is to come and strategize for the future. Now, I'm not a prophet, not the son of a prophet, but I do work for a non-profit organization. <laughs> I see something sinister coming, like a beast rising out of the sea, ready to eat its fill of flesh. What we'll encounter in the future is not the inclusive multiculturalism of Menzies or Hawke. What we're going to face will be more likely a form of civic totalism that believes religion and religious people are the one impediment to achieving a progressive paradise on earth. Remember this, the greatest violence in the world is not by, done by men who believe that what they do is wicked. It's done by men who believe that what they do is righteous. People who believe that the subjugation of religion to the state is the key to the salvation of the state. I see something coming uh, like a halfway point between the old Soviet Union and the Third French Republic where there will be, I think, punitive actions towards faith communities. I don't just mean losing cultural privileges. Look, if they don't say the Lord's Prayer before Parliament, my world is not going to end. I don't really mind being um, mocked by some of these comedians who have the intellectual depth of a car park puddle. <laughs> People who are religiously illiterate and for whom coherence for them would be a crime. That doesn't bother me. But we are going to have to negotiate our way in a very changing world. Under duress, many so-called believers will experience the theological equivalent of Stockholm Syndrome. They will obey and worship the beast in the quest for relevance and acceptance. But if you want to be popular, my advice is give away free meat pies at the MCG. <laughs> Others will resist. Resist in the way of Jesus Christ. I've tried to set out my own brief strategy for resistance, the Thessalonian strategy. But what is paramount, I submit to you, my friends, is faithfulness. To quote St. John the Divine, this calls for pace and endurance on part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. And in the words of the great American philosopher, Forrest Gump, <laughs> that's all I have to say about that. Thank you.